Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 255 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 28 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. Welcome, everyone, to episode 255. Today, I'm going to be talking about dungeon crawls, specifically how do you run a good dungeon crawl? And uh, this isn't just going to be my thoughts and my advice on the subject. I reached out to listener GMs in our communities and asked everyone to weigh in on this. And we got a lot of great suggestions and ideas on how to run a good dungeon crawl. So we are going to be delving into dungeons today and and digging into the... <laughs> time-honored dungeon crawl, which is really where this this hobby began way back when. So it'll be cool uh, to get back to our roots today and, and talk about dungeons. I want to let you know that I have released the update for my D&D supplement Relics of Power. So Relics of Power tells you how you can create relics for your D&D campaign and relics are magic items that grow in power as the player character who wields them grows in power. So depending on the level of the PC uh, will affect what the particular magic item can do. So in Relics of Power, I talk all about how you can create your own relics, how you can use uh, magic items that are already in the game as inspiration for your relics, even how you can take an existing magic item and change it into a relic. And then I uh, give you some some relics to play with. And among those relics in the supplement are the relics that the player characters have in my D&D campaign, Hinterlands of Alondria, now Blood of the Avatars. Um, so if you've been following along with the actual play in this podcast, then, then you know all about those items. So as part of this update, I have advanced those relics from my campaign uh, to level 17. So in the original version of Relics of Power, uh, they only went up to like level five or seven or, or something like that, because that's where we were in the campaign at the time that I wrote the supplement. And so I have since then uh, developed these all the way up to level 17. Um, So the update has all of those fleshed out all the way to level 17. Um, Also has some revisions and edits and additional explanations just to hopefully uh, make everything more clear to everyone. Um, So that is out. If you have purchased Relics of Power, you should have received an email uh, from my website Uh, with a new download link to get the new version. Everybody who's bought Relics of Power gets gets the new version. Um, So if you didn't get that email or you didn't see it or you lost it or whatever, uh, no worries. Just shoot me an email at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com and uh, I can send that link to you so you can get the update. I'm also working on a player's guide for Primordia, which, which is really just a lot of stuff I've homebrewed for my D&D games. Um, I'm calling it Adventures of Primordia, and I am editing the final chapter of that, and my wife Nikki is doing the layout, and she's about halfway through that, I think. Um, So I'm really hoping that that we can get that out within the next few weeks. Um, So some of the things that that are in there, I've got some new uh, sub-races for Elves and Azamar. Um, I've got a few new cleric domains, um, something like six new backgrounds, uh, some new equipment, a few new spells, and something around 24 new magic items. So that's the chapter I'm currently working on uh, for the magic items. So it could be slightly more or less than 24, but but right now, as of today, I'm I'm at 24 
uh, new magic items. So that's basically what that supplement's going to be, just a bunch of uh, options for players. And, you know, obviously I developed these for, for my game, which takes place in my homebrew setting of Primordia. And, you know, they're kind of tied to that setting, at least somewhat. Um, but all of these are things that you can use in your D&D game, no matter, you know, where your game takes place. If you're using the Forgotten Realms or some other official setting or your own homebrewed world, um, these are just a bunch of options that, that you can use for your players if you want to. So yeah, hopefully that'll be out uh, in the next few weeks. So so keep an eye on the website for that. And uh, I'll definitely announce it on Twitter and MeWe and Discord and, and all those places as well. Um, but yeah, really, really excited to get that out and, and see what people think of it. Um, you know, I, some of the players in my campaign, I have one player that's using, uh, one of my new cleric domains. Um, I think I have a couple players that are using, um, some of my backgrounds. Um, they've been using the magic items and the spells and, and so far, at least for my players, I've, I've had, um, uh, good feedback and, and they dig it. So, so hopefully you will as well. All right. Well, that's uh, that's all about that. Um, I want to get on to talking about dungeons because we have a lot to say about dungeons today. So without further ado, let's delve into a dungeon. All right, so our topic today of how to run a good dungeon crawl uh, came to me thanks to listener GM Kendall, who sent me an email, and he said, hey, Lex, just got finished listening to your take on Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and it fit perfectly for me in planning what to do next for my own group. So that's awesome. Glad to hear that. I've been running my own take on the Princes of the Apocalypse campaign with a group of nine PCs. After having a talk with them, we've decided they are overwhelmed with the amount of choice they have in how to tackle the four cults. So yeah, Princes of the Apocalypse, I haven't played that entire campaign. I played the beginning of it um, and I flipped through it. But my, my understanding is that it's fairly open-ended. I mean, there are dungeons in that campaign, but the player characters have a lot of freedom and it's fairly sandboxy in, in how they approach all that. And yeah, that can be a little overwhelming uh, for some groups. And, and, you know, Kendall here has nine players, so I'm, I'd be willing to bet that's part of it. Um, but yeah, kind of uh, a lot of, uh, not, not a lot of direction as c compared to like, say, a dungeon. It's not uncommon for us to spend a whole three hours just deciding on how to attack one of the enemy's bases. I give them hooks, including secret tunnels, smuggling or amassing an army, but still that doesn't seem to expedite the planning process. We've decided to treat the rest of the campaign like a dungeon crawl with little motivation other than, there we go attack. <laughs> the player's words, not mine, he says. So my question is this, how do you run a good dungeon crawl? I'm used to making epics or adventure style games, so I'm a little out of my depth here. I've got the campaign's writing to go off of, but is there anything else I can do to improve the game? Also, I plan on continuing the campaign for them to crawl through other dungeons, so how would I start creating a good dungeon for level 16 and up player characters? So, yeah, this is, uh, this is what we're going to talk today about today, and, and huge thank you to Kendall for, for sending this in, um, because I think this is a great topic for the show. Um, so first of all, Kendall, uh, kudos to you for adjusting what you're doing to what your players enjoy. Um, this is high level GM thinking here. And, and I really want everyone listening to notice here what, what Kendall did. Kendall's running this campaign and noticing um, that the players aren't engaging with it like he'd like. He, he He's noticing problems or what he perceives as problems. They're spending entire game sessions almost planning what to do um they seemed uh overwhelmed by the possibilities and choices and having a hard time coming to a consensus and it sounds like he he discussed this with the players maybe got some ideas from them about what was happening and and how to solve this problem and together as a group they decided hey let's just approach this more as a dungeon crawl make it a little more straightforward um, so, so we can get on and, and have a good time. 
And that's awesome. And that's something, you know, all of us as GM should be doing. We should be um, observing our players and observing our game and um, adjusting as needed so that everybody has a good time. Um, and, you know, he's also running a published campaign and that can be even more difficult to do in a published campaign because sometimes we can feel like, you know, we have to follow what the campaign says and it can feel more restricted in that way. So so awesome on you, Kendall, for for going outside the box and deciding to to try to fix things and, and make the game more enjoyable for everyone. So when I responded to Kendall myself, um, the first thing I kind of gravitated towards uh, was the size of his group. The fact that he has nine players. I mean, that's very large for an RPG group. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, they're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. And it seems to me that the the size of the group could have a lot to do with that. Um, players are notorious for taking forever to plan engagements in RPC in RPGs. And it, it doesn't matter how many players you have. Players love to plan and replan and plan again. Um, also, they can just throw out the plan as soon as uh, initiative is rolled. But <laughs> still, the, the planning happens. Um, and with such a large number of players as, as what Kendall has or, or any group where you have, I'd say, more than four players, um, it's going to take even longer because there are more voices to be heard. There are more opinions to consider. Um, and it's just going to take longer for nine people to come to a consensus than it would for four people. Assuming that every all of those nine people are engaged in the planning process and you don't have some people just like sitting back <laughs> reading their email until the plan is decided on because they don't care. Um, so, you know, even with a small group, this can be a problem or an issue, but it becomes more of an issue the more players you add. So, you know, one tactic that I've used because because I've run for large groups a lot in, in the past um, is to not give the players and not give the characters unlimited time to plan. And there's really two ways you can approach this. And I would recommend using both um, to some degree or another. So first off, you can give them in story or in world limits to the amount of time that the characters can spend planning. So if you're running a dungeon crawl, um, that's a relatively easy thing to do. Um, if they spend too much time planning, um, have something happen to interrupt them, like a random encounter or uh, a, a patrol that you know is is um, patrolling the area or something like that. Because consider if they're in a dungeon and they're planning for three hours of real world time, they're somewhere in that dungeon having a discussion, probably at times having a heated discussion if they're planning that long. Um, they're making noise. They're making a lot of noise. They're probably using light sources. So during that three hours, anything that happens by there is, is going to notice them. And that's a lot of time for them to spend in one place, making light, making noise, um, planning. So it totally makes sense that eventually something would happen to interrupt them. And, you know, it could be a monster attacking. It could be, NPC showing up, maybe another group of, of adventurers. It doesn't have to be a combat encounter, just something to interrupt that planning process. The idea here is that something happens that the player characters and the players must now react to. They have to stop their planning and react to this thing that just happened, whether it's a monster that attacks them or a group of NPCs that come into the room um, or a strange voice that starts speaking to them or, or whatever it is. So, so that's the first approach. Use real in-world reasoning of, you know, what could happen while they're standing here planning over and over and over. And the second approach is in uh, more of a table thing, more of an out of story, out of setting thing where you give the players a real world time limit and you tell them what that time limit is and you use some kind of a timer or an alarm or something. So you could tell them something like, I'm going to give you guys half an hour to plan and then we're going to go on or an hour or however long you want to give the, give them. And then you set a timer and when the timer goes off, planning is over and, and we're moving on. And if the players 
refuse to move on at that point, then that's when you can have the random encounter or the, the patrol or whatever else happen to, to interrupt them. So again, I, I use both of these techniques and, and they work really well together. Um, you might use some for some situations and the other for other, you know, at, at a certain time, it, it might make more sense just to tell the players, Hey, you guys have 30 minutes to plan. And then we're going on, um, at another time, you might already have an idea of something that's going to interrupt them. So you don't need to give the players a time limit because you're going to sit there and listen to their planning. And when the time is right, you've already got something to interrupt them with. And also with, with such a large number of players, especially if they're higher level, um, speed of play and pacing of the game is going to become a real concern. And, you know, in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, gameplay tends to get slower the higher level the player characters get. You know, if you look at the amount of time that, say, a round of combat takes um, from first level to fifth level to 10th level to 15th level to 20th level, as you get higher and higher level, uh, those rounds are going to take longer and longer because the players have more complicated things they can do. They have more choices to choose from, and it just it just takes longer. They have more actions. Um, so it's just part of a lot of these games that the more powerful the players get, the, the slower gameplay tends to get. Um, so you want to be aware of that and have some strategies to counteract that. So I just threw out some ideas to Kendall of ways to keep the game going and speed things up, especially in combat, because that usually is where things will really bog down. Well, that and player planning, but that's got nothing to do with the game system. Um, so my first suggestion is to use my system for initiative. I've talked about it a lot on the show, and I did an extensive blog post on it, which I'll link in the show notes. So I'm not going to go through that here, but I basically have a way that I handle initiative that I think really speeds up play and um, even more than speeds up play, it, it really helps with the pacing so you don't have things bogging down so much every time you enter a combat. So, so you can check that out on my blog. Another thing you can do is have the turn order somewhere where the players can see it. So there are products out there where like dry erase boards or whatever that you can track turn order on. Um, a really simple and elegant and cheap solution uh, that the guy that's at Wizards use that I really like is getting some three by five index cards, folding them in half so you can hang them over the top of your GM screen. On the half that's facing the players, you put the character's name. On the half that's facing you, you can put things about that character you might need to know, like their passive perception, their armor class, stuff like that. And then you can put those on your GM screen in the turn order. And every time a player takes their turn, when their turn's over, you move their card back to the end of the line. And then that way the players can look at that and see who's next and whose turn is when. Um, and another part of that is every time you announce a player's turn, you tell the next player that they're on deck. So for example, you might say, okay, Nikki, it's your turn now. And Sam, you're on deck. So that way Sam is reminded that, Hey, I'm next. I should be thinking about what I'm going to do. And, you know, really important with especially higher level characters is, you know, making sure that your piece, your players understand that they should be thinking about what they're going to do on their turn before it's their turn. When their turn comes, they should already know what they're going to do. That's not when they should decide what they're going to do and look up the spells they're going to cast and things like that. They should be doing that before it's their turn. Now, of course, things will happen. And, you know, I usually play spellcasters, So I, I know this very well as a player, you know, you might have your turn planned and then the person right before you does something that changes things. And now, you know, you have to start over. Um, and you know, that's unavoidable. That's going to happen. But at least if you're planning your turn ahead of time, at least sometimes, uh, when the DM gets to you, you're going to know what you want to do and bam, you know, you've got your spells ready. You've already looked them up. You already know everything the DM needs to know about the spell or the ability you're using. And people don't have to sit and wait for you to figure out what you're going to do on your turn. So a great way to facilitate that as a DM is to one, have the turn order visible so the players can see it and to always remind the player who's on deck that they're coming up next so that they can start thinking about their turn if they haven't already. Also, another thing you can do, uh, especially with larger groups that can be helpful, or if you just have certain players that tend to monopolize time at the table 
is give each player a time limit for their turn, especially in combat. Um, this could be 30 seconds or less. It could be a minute, whatever it is, but it's fair. Every player has the same amount of time to decide what they're going to do. And if that time has elapsed and they're not resolving what they're going to do already, if they're still trying to decide what to do, then they forfeit their turn. Um, and usually that will only need to happen once or twice in a given game session uh, for players to start planning ahead and be ready when their turn happens because players really hate losing a turn. Um, so that works really well too. Uh, another trick is to have the players roll their attack dice and their damage dice together in one roll. Um, so if we're talking D&D, &D, they can roll their D20 to hit and their damage dice in one roll. And that way, if the attack misses, well, it doesn't matter. But if the attack hits, the damage die dice have already been rolled. And it really, I mean, it saves a small amount of time per turn. But over the, the course of a game session, it, it adds up to a lot of save time. I've, I've played with groups that do this. And I've played with groups that don't do this. And the groups that roll all their dice at once definitely um, get through combat a lot quicker than the ones that don't. Another thing you can do as a DM to help with this, um, so far we've been talking a lot about player side of the screen stuff, but there's things the DM can do too, is um, try to avoid uh, combats or encounters with lots of monsters. The more turns in a combat, whether those turns are by an NPC or a PC, the longer that combat is going to take, the longer each round is going to take. And really for me, um, definitely if, if a combat is too long, like a combat that takes an hour is really long and people are going to get tired of it. Um, and that's definitely a factor, but I think the biggest factor is actually how long each round of combat takes. You can have a fairly long combat, but if each round doesn't take that long, then the players aren't having to sit around waiting on their turn as long and it it's more enjoyable. So really, as a GM, my main focus in combat is how long is each round of combat taking less so than, than the entire combat. So we're trying to keep each round as short as possible to minimize the amount of time that each player is sitting there waiting for their chance to take their turn. So again, you know, the more turns there are in a combat, the longer it's going to take. So one way to speed things up is to not use a bunch of monsters. I mean, it's, you, you can throw 20 weak monsters at the players, but if each monster has one action, that's 20 actions you have to deal with as a DM, um, which is going to take more time. Um, so you can focus more on more powerful monsters, just have one really badass legendary monster or a few more powerful monsters for them to fight. Um, also keep in mind how many actions each monster takes. How many times are you going to have to roll dice for the monsters? Like, do they have multi-attack? Are they going to attack five times a round? Because, you know, the thing slowing down the combat is the number of actions, which is connected to the number of monsters. But you could only have one monster, but that monster has 12 actions. So it's going to slow things down just as much as if you had 12 monsters with one action or or close to it. So, yeah. Fewer, more powerful monsters will lead to uh, quicker combats than um, a large number of weaker monsters. You can also use the optional rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide for um, mob, mob rules for handling groups of monsters as a single monster. Um, and this can speed up things a lot on your end as a DM. You know, if they're fighting a bunch of goblins, you can use mob rules that to... Um, handle the goblins um, with fewer dice rolls. Uh, this can also be really useful with any kind of PC that's summoning a lot of creatures. So this could be druids or wizards or sorcerers or clerics um, that are summoning, you know, again, it's the same thing. You know, you're adding more turns to the combat. So if you have a druid that's going to summon 20 leprechauns or whatever, um, use the mob rules and handle them as a single monster and it speeds things up a lot. Another tactic that I found that works great for large groups outside of combat is to use initiative outside of combat when, whenever I think it will help. So often with a large group of players, you know, you've got a lot of people wanting to do or some, say something in a, in a role-playing scene, 
Um, and using initiative helps you as a DM manage that and keep it fair and give every player an equal chance to do or say the thing that they that they want so that you don't have the more extroverted players kind of walking over the more introverted players. You can use initiative to make sure everybody gets a chance to do something. So that can be really helpful in non-combat situations, especially with larger groups. All right. So there's a lot more to think about when running a, a dungeon or any kind of an adventure um, than just speeding up gameplay. Um, so I asked other listener GMs in our communities to weigh in on this. And I heard from Jim on Discord, who suggested set piece encounters, whether they be combat, traps, puzzles, etc. I always think of a series of fun set pieces when I think dungeon crawls. And yeah, this is a great suggestion. You know, I personally would suggest uh, shooting for a good set piece encounter at the very least every other gaming session. Um, ideally, you'd have one every game session, um, but that's not always possible. And, and you don't want to force it, right? Um, you want it to feel feel right, feel natural and realistic. Um, so don't force it. But I think shooting for every other session is is a pretty achievable thing to do. And keep in mind, I tend to play three or four hour sessions. Um, so if you're playing longer game sessions, then, then you should definitely be able to have at least one set piece in, in every single game session. Um, you don't want to use these big set piece encounters too much. You know, the more common something becomes, the less impact it's going to have. The, the more often you see something extraordinary, the more ordinary it becomes, right? So you don't want to use them too much. Um, but these set piece encounters will most likely be the things that the players remember most about your adventure or your dungeon months or even years later. Um, so they're important and, and it's what the players are going to remember. It's what you're going to remember. They're going to be the highlights of, of your campaign. Um, so it's a good idea to, to spend some time on them and, and really come up with some cool stuff. They can do a lot to break up the monotony of a dungeon crawl and these set piece encounters are a great way to help yourself as a GM think outside of the boxes that you're kind of creating for yourself with the particular dungeon that you're running. Um, it's a chance for you to really change things up. So, you know, what I'm talking about here is if you're designing a dungeon, you know, you're going to have, you know, a certain theme for your dungeon. You know, what, what does it look like? What kind of materials are the walls and the floors made out of? What are the doors made out of? What kind of lighting does it have? Uh, what kind of creatures created this dungeon and why? What kind of creatures are here? So you're you're kind of creating all these parameters for your dungeon and for yourself designing within it. Um, and it's good to occasionally break out of that and, and step outside of all those boxes you've made for yourself and, and do something truly different. And that will really help your dungeon not be so monotonous. And a, a set piece encounter is a perfect time to do that. Floyd on Discord said, one big thing is that you need inhabitant dy dynamism. <laughs> uh, monsters should make sense, should have interactions with each other, and should carve out their own ecological niche. So there's actually a couple things here, I think. You know, one is, is to think about how you, the monsters and the NPCs in the dungeon relate to one another. Do they get along? Do they not? How nuanced is that? Um, are there uh conflicts going on within the dungeon probably that probably should be um are these things that the player characters can somehow use to their advantage um and another thing i think floyd is talking about here is what we commonly refer to as dungeon ecology um which, which is basically this idea that you know your dungeon should quote make sense you know <laughs> Where where are all these creatures and NPCs getting their food? Where are they getting their water? Um, things like that. You know, uh, usually you can't grow plants in a dungeon. There's no sunlight. Things like that. Where where are they? Where how are they surviving in this place? Um, and the idea is that, that this should make sense so that if the players start um, interrogating or investigating your dungeon, it doesn't fall apart or doesn't seem uh, contrived. So I think dungeon ecology can be important if you want it to be. I think um, it's definitely something to be aware of, 
it's not necessarily something you need to or want to worry about with every dungeon you do, but it's something you at least want to know is a thing that exists and is out there. Um, and it's definitely something you want to think about if you think it can give you some creative inspiration as far as how to design your dungeon, what to put in it, things like that. So, so if you're using this idea of dungeon ecology as a springboard to help you come up with things and add some complexity and nuance to your dungeon, um, that's awesome. However, I think that the importance of dungeon ecology is often overstated or exaggerated, at least in certain circles. Um, yes, you can put a lot of time and effort into making your dungeon make as much sense as you can and be as, quote, realistic as possible. But at the end of the day, dungeons aren't realistic to begin with. So it's kind of a losing battle to try to make it completely realistic. Um, you know, things like where do all the inhabitants get their food and water and other resources that they need? Do they all get along? Are they all in conflict? All that stuff. Um, so, you know, I don't know that you need to worry about that being quote realistic all the time. Only if uh, it's important to you or you think or more to the point, it's going to be important to the story or to how the player characters are, approach the dungeon. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind here that always comes to my mind when people start talking a lot about um, dungeon ecology is um, <laughs> we're playing a fantasy game in a fantasy world here, um, a world with magic. Um, in an average D&D session, we are surrounded by things that are impossible or don't make sense or wouldn't make sense in our world. Um, things that defy logic, things that defy physics, or just don't make sense. And we don't even blink. You know, we seldom wonder about the fact that a dragon could never actually physically fly because, well, magic. Um, we don't worry about the fact that a city the size of Waterdeep probably couldn't exist without modern sanitiz sanitation um, and other technologies because magic. We, we don't worry about the fact that PCs can take the beatings that they do and be at full fighting strength the next day, even without any healing spells because, well, magic. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Floyd here or his suggestion. Um, dungeon ecology is definitely something you can think about to add depth to your dungeon and perhaps take you to interesting places creatively um, that you might not have gone to otherwise but you don't want to let it become a trap to your thinking, um, another box that you're trapped in. Um, you don't need to worry about it or even think about it in every dungeon. I know a big fear that's often mentioned when people talk about dungeon ecology is that the dungeon won't, quote, make sense to the players um, if you don't consider these things. But I don't really think that's a concern that you need to worry about too much. Personally, I've never had this come up in any of my games. And honestly, especially in the early days, I didn't worry a lot about dungeon ecology and I never ever once had a player uh, make an issue about it or have it cause any kind of problem at the table. Um, and honestly, if your players are sitting around wondering where the goblins go to the bathroom in your dungeon and that's taking them out of the game and ruining the game for them, um, I would be willing to bet that you have bigger problems at work there than dungeon ecology. There's other things going on in your game that's leading to that. The problem isn't that you didn't think about where the goblins go to the bathroom. The, the problem's probably somewhere else. Um, so if this ever does come up, um, you know, it's a pretty easy thing to handle. Um, you don't have to spend a ton of time with it because again, magic, it's fantasy. So you can just put a few fonts in your du dungeon that dispense water like a decanter of endless water does. And, and we've seen this in published adventures. Um, the goblins could have a shaman that can cast, create food and water, things like that. I mean, it's so easy to just come up with these kind of hand wave solutions to the whole dungeon ecology problem if you don't want to spend a lot of time with it, but you still want to at least have a nod to it in case the players wonder about it. Now, as far as where the goblins or anyone else goes to the bathroom in your dungeon, do we really need to go there? I mean, do we really? I mean, think about it. How many published dungeons that you've read or seen 
had restrooms in them on the map. Yes, some of them do. <laughs> I know people are going to write me with examples of dungeons that have bathrooms in them, and I've seen them too, but they're not the majority of dungeons. The majority of dungeons I've seen don't have bathrooms in them unless it's like uh, the quote dungeon is like a human manor or something like that. And even then a lot of times they don't think to put bathrooms or outhouses or latrines or whatever in them. You know, I always think about like TV and movies and all the decades of Star Trek shows that I've seen. Um, I've never once seen a toilet on the Enterprise and it hasn't bothered me or many other people, honestly, um, other than just wondering what does the bathroom on the Enterprise look like? Um, you know, when you think about it, the only time you even see a restroom in a TV show or a movie or any kind of a story is when important dialogue is happening there. And then you know, the restroom isn't there to show you that restrooms exist. It's just a setting for this important dialogue that's happening, that's advancing the story. The restroom doesn't matter. Um, so the same principle, I think, can be a guiding light in your dungeon design or your adventure design. You should probably only spend um, a lot of time thinking about dungeon ecology if it's going to matter to the story somehow or the experience of the dungeon somehow or, or your player's strategy. Um, another way to say it is if you're going to worry about the ecology, then make it matter somehow. Don't spend a bunch of time figuring all this out and then it doesn't matter and the players never know about it or interact with it. Um, you know, otherwise you're spending time world building details in your dungeon that are never going to see the light of day and will never be noticed by the players. At which point, what is the point? <laughs> that time probably could have been spent better on, on something else. So one piece I will, of advice I will give is if your players think of something you missed, like dungeon ecology, something uh, you didn't think of or, or didn't spend time figuring out, um, and it makes sense, just roll with it. And, and this is probably why, honestly, it's never been an issue in my games. Isn't maybe that none of my players have ever thought about any of this stuff. It's just that anytime it has come up, I just roll with it on the fly um, and that's really all you need to do. Um, so a classic example here is, let's say the players are exploring a dungeon um, and they find a pool of water in a cavern. And this is the first source of water they've seen in the dungeon. And you just put this here for some reason. You weren't thinking about dungeon ecology at all. But the players talk amongst themselves and they're like, hey, there's this pool here. This is the first source of water we've seen in this dungeon. So it stands to reason that things that live in the dungeon will come here to drink. So why don't we find a good hiding spot where we can observe this pool of water and we can either just hang out here and for a day or whatever and do some reconnaissance and get a good idea of what's in this dungeon as we watch things come and go to get drinks from the pool of water or we could stage some kind of an ambush and attack something that comes to drink from the pool of water. So now, you know, we're attacking it from an ambush at this pool of water instead of attacking it in its lair where maybe it has traps or, or other defenses. So, you know, if something like this happens and you hadn't considered any of that, you know, just roll with it. You know, look at, look at your dungeon, look at the nearby chambers and the denizens in them and think about, okay, where would these guys get their water? You know, would they go to this pool? And if so, how often? And, and just come up with some, okay, well, if the PCs wait this long, they'll see this. If they wait that long, they'll see that. And, and these are the kinds of things you can do on the fly, improvising during play. And the players are never going to know that you didn't come up with it ahead of time. You know, the, the way you don't want to handle that is just have them wait at the pool forever and nothing ever happens because the player's reasoning makes sense. Unless you have a really good reason that things don't come here to drink water, even though it's not something you planned, even though it's not something you thought of, it makes sense. And it's going to add to the immersion and believability if you play on that than if you ignore it. So a lot of times... The players will come up with this stuff for you if you just listen to them at the table and you can kind of fill that in behind the screen as you go and they'll never know. So, you know, I, I often like to say that, that preparation and improvisation work best together. You know, um, I doubt there's many I, uh, DMs out there who 
improvise everything and don't prepare at all, although they probably exist, but I'll bet they're few and far between. And I really doubt there's any DMs out there who prepare everything and don't improvise at all. If only because you can never plan everything the players will do. You have to improvise as a DM. So really the best is using these two skills together. And there's a time and place for both. So Dungeon Ecology is a great place for improvisation when the players come up with something that makes a lot of sense, but you didn't think of it. Um, Just roll with it on the fly. All right, getting back to Floyd's comments, he says another big theme I make use of is the passage of time and resource constraints. Food and water aren't plentiful generally. Safe spaces to rest should be few and far between and should be hard fought for. Yes, absolutely. Um, You're going to see, we'll come back to this idea of the PCs taking rests and how easy that will be um, here in a minute um, and what the consequences of taking a rest will be. But if, when, and how much PCs can rest come into play in a lot of ways in a dungeon and have a lot to do with the tension and drama and also how difficult the dungeon is. So these are all dials we can adjust on the fly during prey during play. Um, So don't overlook, uh, you know, these random or flexible encounters um, that could happen uh, when PCs rest. Uh, The survival aspect can also come into play if you want it to, or you can hand wave it away. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish, what you're going for, uh, what your players enjoy, uh, what your focus is for this particular dungeon. Sometimes whether or not the PCs have enough food, water, ammunition, torches, rope, and other supplies can be important and interesting to the story. And so you want to focus on that. You want to um, pay attention to that. Um, it can set up tension and drama if they run out of food or their last torch burns out. Uh, and it can be a problem for the players to solve. And that can all be fun. Other times, it's all just going to distract from what's really important to you or the players or what's going on. I've run dungeons where I've tracked all these things, ammunition, food, water, torches, all of it. And I made it matter to what was going on. And it, it mattered that we tracked it and it mattered how many torches they had or how many arrows they had. Um, I've also run dungeons where I hand waved all of that away. And we just all assumed that the PCs were competent enough to bring what they needed with them And we left it at that and we never worried about it. So it all depends on what you're going for. It also depends on what your players enjoy. Some players love that stuff. They love tracking ammunition. Some players hate it. Um, So yeah, if you don't know, ask your players, hey, how would you guys feel about this? So there are lots of things to think about when you're designing a dungeon or a series of dungeons. So my advice to you would be, you know, so you don't get overwhelmed, just focus on a few things at a time and keep going until you feel like your dungeon is, is ready. Otherwise, you could get uh, analysis paralysis. So Floyd goes on to say each PC in the party should have a role to play, a map maker, a chronicler, a treasurer, etc. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Every player, every player's character in the group should have a purpose or a role in that party and have something to do, if not in every encounter, at least in every game session. And I honestly think this is more in the hands of the players and in the characters that they create. But as the GM, you can guide the players and remind them to think about this kind of stuff when they're making their characters so that they can work together well as a team. And and I always remind my players, you know, don't just think about the character you want to play, but think about the group or the party or the team you all are creating together and what role your character is going to play in that group And is that group overall going to have everything it needs to do what what you guys want the group to be able to do to be successful? So this is something I pay a lot of attention to, uh, especially in D&D. In other games, like for instance, Numenera, it doesn't matter so much. But in a game like D&D, you do have these kind of roles that you need and only certain characters can fill them. So it's something that the DM and the players want to think about when they're making characters for a given campaign or a given dungeon. Um, and this is something that I've actually codified in my setting of Primordia because I think it's that important. So in Primordia, I have a guild of adventurers that it's assumed player characters are a part of. And 
you know, not just anybody can be in the Guild of Adventurers. They have to accept you into their ranks. You have to prove that you're good enough to be in the Guild. And it, it's you're not accepted as an individual. You're accepted as a member of a group. So it's on the adventurers to create a team or a party together. And then as a team, they apply to enter the guild. And so one of the things the guild looks at when they apply is not just the individual ability of each person in the team, but also does this team have everything it needs to be successful? Will this team uh, do well or are there glaring uh, missing elements? For instance, uh, you know, someone capable of healing and curing diseases, removing curses, things like that. It's a pretty important thing to have. Um, so you're not likely to get into the guild if your team doesn't have some way to deal with that kind of stuff. So this gives me a way in game or in story to tell the players, hey, you need to come up with a party or team that's viable and at least has the necessities covered. Um, the players are going to thank you for this kind of thing later because it really sucks having a whole game session where your character has nothing meaningful they can do, or it really sucks to have a, a big deficiency in your party, like no healing ability um, that you either just have to live without or uh, making things a lot more difficult, or the DM has to fill in that role with an NPC um, that travels with the party. Um, so, so this can be mitigated by thinking about this during character creation. Floyd goes on to say, making use of the environment is good too. It's oppressive, often cramped, and the monsters know it like the back of their hand. I agree with Jim on making the encounter set pieces and leveraging the environment. Encounters that are just two groups in a room battering each other get boring pretty quickly. Use secret doors and tunnels, cramped hallways, traps, furniture, etc. to the monster's advantage. Yeah, yeah, the more of that kind of stuff you can throw in for the monsters and the player characters to use... Uh, the more interesting uh, the encounters will be and the less they will run together and all just seem the same. Secret doors and puzzles should offer extra goodies or shortcuts, but shouldn't be dead ends if not found or overcome. Um, or I would add, at least be aware of what you're doing if you're going to make a dead end like that. So if you create a secret door or a tunnel or something like that that has to be found in order for the players to continue on through the dungeon you either may need to make sure the pcs find that secret one way or another or you want to have a contingency in place for what happens if they don't find it and the answer to that question being the game ends and we stop playing isn't a good answer <laughs> you need a better answer than that so if they need to find the secret door to go on what happens if they don't um, and you need to have a solution for that. Uh, let's see. Floyd goes on to say, it's a challenge to keep it all fresh and interesting. I find incorporating story elements and factions to be useful, though not, as Lex pointed out in the Undermountain Review, just two factions on each level in conflict. Yeah, you want to change it up a bit. My entire dungeon was several has several main groups and there are smaller groups scraping away at the margins. Uh, we also heard from King on Discord, who says... Uh, I think both Floyd and Jim have great ideas on this. I would like to add that you should make sure choice is still present. A lot of people make a dungeon as a linear experience, but there isn't a need for that. And, and by that, we, we mean that there's no, there's only one way through the dungeon. There's only one path. You don't have choices as far as which parts of the dungeon you explore in which order or at all. You, you just have to follow the breadcrumbs through the dungeon. That's a linear dungeon. So King says that there isn't any need for a linear dungeon. You can still role play down there and decide on what paths to take, what monsters to fight, or how to fight them. I think it's good to have more than one way to move up and down between levels of the dungeon. Mix up traveling like water or type spaces. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. Uh, a linear dungeon is going to get old really fast. So personally, I would at the most maybe... Maybe you can have parts of the dungeon that are linear, linear, but definitely not the whole thing. Uh, one thing that I'd add to this um, that's forgotten in published adventures surprisingly often is think about what's going to happen at the end of the dungeon after um, the PCs defeat the big bad or whatever is at the end of the dungeon. And by that, I mean, how are the player characters going to get out of the dungeon at the end? Um, as a general rule, I think you want to give them some kind of shortcut 
out of the dungeon that can't be exploited to cheat and get to the end sooner. But once they've beat the dungeon, they can use a shortcut to get out and get on with their lives. Nothing's worse than going through this big, long dungeon, finally defeating the boss and realizing you now have to retrace your entire path all the way out through the dungeon again, especially if there's still going to be random encounters and monsters to deal with. Um, that's really anticlimactic and, oh my God, the, those are the game sessions the players will skip or find some reason they can't, can't come. Um, sure, you can hand wave that away and just move on to when they're back in town or whatever, but I feel like that's a little lame. I think it's a better solution to have some kind of shortcut. So this could be some kind of a secret tunnel or portal or teleportation circle at the end of the dungeon so the players can get out of there when they're done and go on to the, the next adventure. Um, you know, trust me, once the players have beat the dungeon, you don't want to be in there any more than they do at that point. You just want to go on to the next thing. You've had, you've had enough of that dungeon at that point. Also with a larger dungeon, think also, and, and this was mentioned before, about having shortcuts between levels. Think about how your players will approach and explore the dungeon. So especially if this is the kind of dungeon where they're going to be able to enter it, explore a bit, leave, and then come back multiple times, um, you want to have shortcuts so that they can skip some of the stuff they've done previously um, to facilitate that and, and just save you all a bunch of time, hassle, and headache, especially if you want them to be able to leave the dungeon and come back. Um, Cause that's all ways to dissuade them from leaving is like, Oh, you're going to have to go through all that stuff to get out of here, you know, is going to make them not want to leave. So if you want them to be able to leave and go to town and rest and get supplies, then, then those shortcuts become really important. Uh, King also suggests roll for encounters. Um, it can really light a fire under the player's butts. If they think wasting time will lead to more trouble it also makes resting more tense. And I completely agree. Uh, DM Dave on our MeWe community said, in my opinion, one characteristic of a good dungeon crawl is the challenge of finding a resting spot. Short rests will be difficult to come by without some clever preparation, magical or otherwise, and long rests may be impossible for the entire party and if attempted, may include some seriously dangerous repercussions. And and he kind of uh, touches on a, a cool... Uh, possibility here is maybe the entire party can't take a long rest, but one of them can. If, if someone really needs one, maybe that one character can have a long rest while everybody else uh, protects them. Could be a possibility. So yeah, I totally agree with this. Um, th this really helps fight the whole 15 minute adventuring day problem, which is where the player characters will engage with a few or a couple or just one encounter and use all their highest level spells and most powerful abilities and then just rest and recharge and continue on. Um, this will make your encounters way too easy unless you make every encounter crazy hard and it's not remotely realistic or satisfying for the players or you. And you're all going to get tired of the dungeon really quick if you let these 15 minute adventuring days happen over and over again, because there's no challenge, there's no tension, there's no drama. Um, so having random or my flexible encounters, which you could read more about on my blog, um, can solve this problem because the players know if they rest, they may have encounters that happen that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's something they have to think about. Also, think about the inhabitants of your dungeon, especially if they're at all organized. The longer the player characters are in the dungeon, the more likely their presence will be discovered and word will be spread to other people in other places in the dungeon that they haven't even explored yet. So if they take too long, suddenly the enemies know they're coming before they get there. The player characters are not surprising them anymore. Now the player characters are dealing with ambushes and traps and the monsters or NPCs have all the advantage because they know the player characters are coming. They may even know their party makeup and, and what they're capable of, what some of their abilities are. Um, so maintaining the element of surprise is almost always important to your players who, at least players who are thinking at all strategically, they're going to want to maintain secrecy and surprise as much as possible. And the longer they're in the dungeon, the more they risk losing that edge. And, you know, hours of gameplay of exploring a dungeon, hours of real world gameplay might translate to just a single hour in world time. 
But as soon as they take a long rest, that's eight hours. So one long rest may equal more time in the dungeon than eight game sessions put together when you think about it. So that's a lot of time for them to be discovered. That's a lot of time for monsters and NPCs to compare notes and prepare for what the player characters are going to do next. DM Dave goes on to say light usually comes up, though in 5e it is less of an issue with light cantrips and everyone having dark vision. Well, not everyone has dark vision. <laughs> that, that's funny. I just, as an aside, I hear this a lot. I see this a lot online, like people saying that everybody in 5th edition has dark vision or most people do. And maybe it's just the, the characters my players play, but in every fifth edition group I've run, usually at least half the player characters don't have dark vision, or at least there's one or two that don't, which really, as soon as you have one character that doesn't have dark vision, it kind of negates the advantage of having dark vision to a large degree. Um, so I, I don't have that experience or perception that everybody has dark vision. Um, I kind of wish everybody did have dark vision because I feel like it would make things easier. Anyway, back to uh, what DM Dave was saying, you know, torches can burn out and add to the time pressure and, you know, they only have so much time, so they should make the best of it. And that's a great point. And, you know, I, I think this is still an issue in fifth edition, you know, lots of races don't have dark vision, like humans and um, dragonborn don't have it. There's a lot of races I feel like should have it that don't um, also, even with dark vision, Keep in mind, it's limited in range, usually 60 feet, which if you use a grid, you know, 60 feet, even in a dungeon, isn't really that far. Um, and even when something is within range of their dark vision, um, you are still at a disadvantage with all perception roles involving sight because they're considered to be in dim light when using dark vision. So, you know, it's still going to be a problem. Personally, I find the lack of light annoying. Um, and usually it doesn't add a whole lot to the fun for me, I feel like. Um, the only thing I really notice much is that if the PCs are using a light source like the light spell or, or torches, it's going to be pretty much impossible for them to sneak up on anyone in the dungeon. The denizens of the dungeon will see the PCs coming long before they have any chance of being aware of them. So, you know, if a denizen has line of sight to the PC's light source, they can see them. doesn't matter how far away they are. I think in a world without dark vision, this would be a lot more interesting. But when some of the PCs have dark vision and some don't, it just kind of becomes a pain in the ass in my experience. But yeah, it, it's just annoying. So much so that I've considered just giving all player characters dark vision and Primordia and, and also saying that they can see uh, with dark vision as if it's bright light instead of dim light to get rid of the disadvantage on perception just to make things simpler and get on with the game. And I thought I actually had mitigated this by saying that it never gets truly dark at night in Primordia because of all the stars and nebulas and galaxies and things. Um, however, if you're in a forest under, you know, treetops or you're in a dungeon, it still gets dark. So you still have to deal with the darkness, dark vision thing. Uh, Floyd weighed in again and said each time the party overcomes a boss character, they find clues about other things going on, often the in the form of correspondence from allies or enemy factions, prisoners left behind and other things. And yeah, and this is a great way to get some of the world building that you've done in the hands of the players. Um, and yeah, just keep in mind all intelligent NPCs or monsters in the dungeon um, know things. What what do they know? Think about that. Um, and it's good for you to know that for when the PCs take prisoners and interrogate the denizens of the dungeon. All right. Tim uh, from MeWe said, put interesting things in each room. They don't all need to lead to combat, but an empty featureless room isn't very interesting. And yeah, Absolutely. Um, you know, you can have some empty rooms in your dungeon. Um, if, you know, it makes sense that there, there might be some empty rooms, um, but don't overdo it. Um, I feel like some of the more recent adventures from Wizards, for instance, kind of overuse the empty room thing and it, it just starts to feel like lazy design. And it's like, well, if you're going to have so many empty rooms in your dungeon, maybe just make it a smaller dungeon and not have so many empty rooms. Because, yeah, empty rooms aren't, aren't terribly interesting. Um, Honestly, the only way I've really seen empty rooms be interesting is they're often a place where player characters will end up trying to take that long rest or short rest. Um, but other than that, yeah, they're not of much use. So I think we've covered a lot of good stuff here um, about 
you know, how to run a good dungeon. Uh, another thought I have is to think twice before doing a quote mega dungeon or doing a really long dungeon or even uh, a, a series of different dungeons in succession. Um, if you're like me or if your players are like me, um, you might find the idea really tempting. It sounds kind of cool at first, but in my experience, these mega dungeons are really hard, if not impossible, I'd say impossible personally, uh, to pull off well. And by that, I mean doing the whole thing without you and or the players getting bored with it or sick of it. And I have never been able to do one of these mega dungeons without like wanting to set the thing on fire before we get to the end. Um, yes, you can have different themes within your mega dungeon and change it up from level to level. And you can see some examples of this in dungeons like Under Mountain or Temple of Elemental Evil. But in my experience, it doesn't really relieve the slog of a dungeon that lasts an entire campaign. So putting different set dressings on a dungeon, it's still a dungeon. Okay, and now instead of fire, fighting fire creatures, we're fighting water creatures. It's still a dungeon. Um, and yeah, as I, as I mentioned, I'd even avoid chaining different dungeons together. It leads to the same thing, which is to say monotony. In my experience, the best approach is to run shorter dungeons or if the dungeon is longer, allow the player characters to leave and even do other things, other adventures, uh, and then come back to the dungeon later. But ideally, I think the best thing is to run shorter dungeons and then between those dungeons, run different types of adventures, things like wilderness exploration or travel or a city-based adventure, something like that. If you're designing a dungeon or even running a dungeon and you feel like you're getting bored with it, or if you feel like the players are getting bored with it, consider flipping the table, so to speak. Change things up a lot. Break the dungeon if you have to. Something like that. Maybe there's an earthquake or a meteor strike and a massive part of the dungeon is destroyed. Maybe a rift opens to the abyss or the plane of fire and demons or elementals pour through it vastly changing the monsters in the dungeon and even the power level of the dungeon. Maybe something teleports the PCs to a totally different dungeon. I mean, the possibilities are endless here, but, but the idea is if you're getting bored, whether it's a dungeon, anything you're doing in the game, if you're getting bored with the adventure, do not be afraid to do whatever you have to do to make it fun and interesting again, even if that means you, quote, break the adventure. It's your adventure. You can break it if you want. Don't be afraid to throw your plans out the window if you come up with a better idea during play or if the players come up with a better idea during play. Run with it. If something excites you, go with it. Follow that excitement. Follow your passion. Uh, your players will thank you for it. So we've covered a lot here about running dungeons, but definitely not everything. This is just a tip of a very large iceberg. So I would love to hear your thoughts Um what advice would you give to other DMs about designing and running dungeons and making them fun for the players? Uh, shoot me an email, gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, there is one question of Kendall's that we didn't address today, which is what about a dungeon crawl for high level players? You know, we've seen wizards approach to this a little bit which uh, often seems to involve putting a lot of restrictions in the dungeon. For, for instance, in Under Mountain, you know, certain types of magic just don't work. Like teleportation just doesn't work. So I don't think that's a great solution personally. It's like the, the players have worked hard to get to this level and now they have these bright, shiny, powerful new toys they want to play with it and you're not going to let them play with their bright, shiny new toys. Like what's the point of giving, getting the 17th level if I can't use my ninth level spells? right? Like it's, it's pretty cheap, honestly. It's pretty poor design in my opinion. Um, so there are definitely better ways to handle that. Um, so what would you do? What are your thoughts? How would you approach a dungeon for high level characters? Let's say level 17 or higher. Um, can you even do a dungeon with high level characters? If so, how would, how would you do it? I, I think this would be a great topic for a future episode. So send me your thoughts, send me your ideas. And uh, yeah, maybe in a future episode, we'll talk about high level dungeons and how to approach those. And I can also bring in any other ideas I get about dungeons in general from other listener GMs. All 
right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode 255 of Game Master's Journey. If you'd like to get a hold of me, shoot me an email at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Lex Starwalker. I also have a voicemail if you'd like to leave a message for the show. The number is 951-GMJ-LEX-1. That's 951-465-5391. And finally, please join our community on MeWe and Discord. And you can find links to all those great things in the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. And finally, if you would like to support the show, there are a lot of great ways uh, that you can do so. You can scroll down to the bottom of the show notes, click that support link, and it'll take you to uh, our support page. There's lots of things you can do to help me out. Uh, probably the best thing you could do is check out my D&D supplements, the latest of which is Relics of Power, which I just updated. And uh, yeah, get yourself a copy of that and let me know what you think of it. I'd really love to hear what you think of Relics of Power, especially if you use some relics in your game. Uh, if you develop your own relics, I'd, I'd love to see them. Let me know. So I hope that you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to run your favorite RPG. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. 